What I'd like to do is spend very, a brief amount of time, just a minute or two, saying something about Caroline Bergvall's VIA, and then we're going to do final words. We're going to wrap up. So um, I'll play a little bit of VIA, and then somebody, uh, maybe Max and Dave, maybe you'd both will be willing to take a real quick crack at just explaining what this is, how she did it, what it is, and then we'll just see how people react to it. So here's Caroline Bergvall, an amazing performer, uh, doing a kind of weird, beautifully, somewhat spooky performance of this poem years ago. Sisson, 1981. Halfway along the journey of our life, I work in wonder in a sunless wood, for I had wandered from the narrow way. Zapula, 1998. Halfway on our life's journey in a wood, from the right path I found myself astray. Parsons, 1893. Halfway through our trek in life, I found myself in this dark wood, miles away from the right road. Ellis, 1995. Halfway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a gloomy wood by reason that the path direct was lost. Pollock. 1854. Halfway upon the journey of our life, I roused to find myself within a forest in darkness, for the straight way had been lost. Johnson, 1915. Max, do you want to just s describe in the most basic way what's going on here? How did she put this together? Sure. So she called all of the translations of the beginning um, of the Inferno, and here has um, organized them, or all the translations into English, I should say, has organized them alphabetically by um, by the by the line, actually. So they're not; it's not chronological; it's not alphabetical by name of the translator, but rather um, by the first word uh, in the Why line. Why choose that uh, way of ordering? Um, it's it's kind of a way of upending, uh, I think, some of our expectations about how uh, an index or an archive works, which usually prioritizes um, uh, history, chronology, or uh, the authors or the writers, the names that are attached to a text, um, and instead uh, prioritizing it by the by the translation, by the text itself. The uh, an index does oddly, especially with poetry, does do this weird alphabetizing uh, of first lines. That's so true, that yes. It's not that. archival, it's not bibliographical, and it's not useful, but it's alphabetical, which should put us in mind maybe of Erica Baum's deconstructing the whole question of the, the categorization of knowledge in the card catalog. Yes, yeah, so she puts that together, and she makes a big long list. And how does she read it, Max? Uh, she reads it pretty much with the same tone um, in this this very calm, kind of lovely, soothing voice. Um, every line. Straight way was lost. Carlisle, 1844. One more. In the mid-journey of our mortal life, I wandered far into a darksome wood, where the true road no longer might be seen. So what, did you say an even voice there? It's almost, it's almost, uh, it's almost cataloging. It's almost like mm. she's doing an autopsy of the archive. Like she's, She's pointing to something and then giving you the information, like you know, okay. here we have Carlisle, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's 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 really uh, it's really haunting. Yeah, it's haunting. So I want to get to the haunting quality. Dave Poplar, do you want to add something to that basic info that people need to know need to know about Via? Dave, are you there? Yeah. Muted, Dave. Dave, unmute. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, no, I think Max covered it. <laughs> oh, after all that, you are too much. Okay, so now let's get some responses to this. All right. Lily, do you want to say something about, do you find it spooky? Haunting, I think is the word. Um, yeah, well, so I, I find the quality of the voice haunting, like Max was saying, um, but also, um, you know, if it, it's this moment where we don't... I mean, you assume that the process of translation would more or less produce the same result without, like, the thinking of a Mod Podcast, 
behind it, just like thinking about what the word translation means. It means take one thing, do a process to it, and you get out an equivalent thing on the other side. And this exercise obviously shows that that's not the case. Um, but I think her point is more than just to talk about the difficulty of um, translation. It's also to say, like, this is a text that is seminal, like considered a high, high, high form of poetry and um, like extremely influential. And yet we may all, depending on when we were born, what language we speak and um, what country we live in, have experienced a different version of the text. Emily, um, what's a point to be taken from this poem? Let's say a Mod Pope point, you know, a, a, a where are we in the history of poetry point. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of folding those two ends of history back on themselves. It's kind of one of the kind of earliest, most seminal works of literature and of, of Dante. first Dante, right? Um, with something really modern and strange and marginal and kind of um, folding them onto each other. Uh, and then kind of, weirdly enough, it kind of makes me think of um, Gertrude Stein. I mean, I guess all of these poems make us think of everything, Gert yeah. everything right? Um, the sense that she's really not, she's very literally not describing something she's compiling Telling something, uh, uh, cataloging something, and um, the poem literally never gets anywhere. You never get out of kind of um, the middle of the stark wood. And well, yet, wait, wait. The poem itself as a form, the, the words don't get anywhere because mm -hmm. she does it over and over again. But the, but the line that she's chosen from Dante is about? About being stuck and lost and unable to find your way. About losing your mm -hmm. way. So this is a Mod Poish thing uh -huh. because this is this sort of anthemic idea of the course, which is that um, poetry one can admire, poetry that I personally admire, uh, is the is a, a poetry that does what it says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So if Dante is, it's 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 kind of like a midlife crisis moment, you know, halfway through my life, I found myself lost, which is a way of saying, where are we going tonight, Walt Whitman? I don't know what's happening. I don't know where we are. I think our car is spinning around on a French countryside road of what shall we, and then let us bless it. There's constant, a constant way in which our poems, the poems that we've curated here in th these 10 weeks, are about not knowing where you're going and never get anywhere, getting anywhere, but in a way that's very productive. When Tracy Morris does exactly what Jason beautifully, eloquently, not sausage, but angels said, or angels that like sausages, um, what, what Jason said is that this, this uh, hesitation, stuttering in the Susan Howe sen me sense meant for Dickinson of this middle passage so that it may not end, so that it, oh, we are always caught, is a positive way of being in the middle of the middle passage. And so to here, um, we are always about to enter and be lost, always. This is true of the haunting quality of Ron Silman's life as summarized in Albany, of any one year of Lynn Hijinian's life, of the, of the um, violence that we experience in Amiri Baraka's incident. So much of what we admire in this poetry is in the process of not knowing what to do and not knowing where to go and not providing answers. So the relationship between Tracy Morris's African and Caroline Bergvall's Via is fundamental. And I would love somebody to, because I just said it at great length, but I'd love for somebody to indicate with a little wag of the finger that they're willing to try to say, restate this and summarize it because it's so crucial. And I'm looking around, and Anna's going to try. Thank you. Well, I guess one thing is that um, poetry doesn't necessarily have to get somewhere or do something. It can just sort of be in itself. Um, and a poem can sort of ask you to sort of like just sit there in it and with it. Um, and that can be enough. Um, and I guess secondly, that at this point in the course, we're looking at poems that are looking to poetry itself as a source for another poem. Um, we don't necessarily need to look to, um, I don't know, it's not necessarily asking like a big question or um, looking at something like feelings. <laughs> Um, poetry itself can just be a source um, for another poem. 
Do you feel like taking a swat at this? Ooh, poems? I poems? have something to say about this, but... Okay, I want to... Yeah. Adelaide, you want to take a swat at this? And then we'll... And Carlos can add his thought, but you need a mic. What we're saying here is uh, what we said all semester, which is all 10 weeks, which is um, how you say what you say is as important as what you say. And also, poems should ideally do what they say, right? So the brain within its groove runs evenly and true, but let a splinter swerve to where easier for you to put a current back like this poem. You'll never put this poem back. It's going where it's going to go. And fuck the mills. Um, so I have two things to say. Uh, the first is I really appreciate what Bergvall does just because as a, I, I'm going to call it a conservative when it comes to um, what I like literarily and, and the and poetically, I guess. Um, she takes something that I like, Dante, and she makes me look at it a different way. Um, I mean, this is a great line and she repeats a great line over and over and over again, which in and of itself enacts the great line. Um, and I think that in a very similar way, that's what Morris does. Um, something that, uh, not in this course, but in the Holocaust course, shameless plug, we've talked about is um, stuttering as sort of a way of communicating and what that means. And um, I think that it's really powerful that in the recording that we heard, she essentially is stuttering to sort of say, I need to get something out, but I can't in the way that you want me to. If I do it smoothly, it will violate, right there is a violation, the violation of the history I'm trying to represent and misrepresentation or constant mistranslation or variations of translation is the only due respect you can pay to something that is this traumatic and terrifying. Carlos, your thought on this, and then we're gonna get final words. Yeah, the, one of the connections I find so interesting um, when I think about these two pieces, and I'll start with Via, is sort of this contradictory thing that she's doing where she's both removing the original poem from its pedestal, but then also sort of um, opening the poem up uh, to be more communal. Like um, saying that, all right, well the truth whatever of this poem um, actually isn't it. That there are all of these different variations or ways of saying this thing that um, through translation or, or through um, <coughs> you know, interactions with the reader um, make up the poem and go into uh, this feeling. Um, and then that same sort of communalness or translation I find present in um, the work we just listened to uh, because it's taking this almost like precious little like tied off line, this opening line you might find in whatever, a film or something. Um, and it's complicating it with this con almost like what I like to call, uh, like the communalness of the self, like that the self in its words contains multitudes or I mean, that's too Whitman-y. But um, basically that we're all sort of made up of all of these different things, all of these different narratives. Um, and she's almost translating that original line to uh, show that in a way that yeah. I think Via is as well. Yeah, well put. Does anybody know the, 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 the work by Bergvall called Say Parsley? Yeah. Okay, so let's try to piece together what's going on there. I'll start. We have, so Say Parsley is based on the idea of a shibboleth. Yeah. What's a shibboleth? It's a word that the pronunciation of which would reveal your ethnicity, place of origin, right. or like the so language. So in, bi you in the speak. biblical Middle East, there are, there are dialects and accents, and if you were really one of us and you came to the gates of the city mm -hmm. rather than some marauder or terrorist, mm -hmm. we would ask you questions, mm -hmm. and there would be a thing, a word to say that would give away whether you were truly native to the place inside. Yeah. So it was uh, it was really a a language test. Mm -hmm. So this work, say Parsley, is based on the massacre of tens of thousands mm -hmm. of Creole Haitians on the border of the Dominican Republic yeah. in 1937 when the criteria for execution was the failure to pronounce Parsley in Spanish mm -hmm. in the accepted Spanish manner as opposed to a more Indio or Dominican manner. Mm -hmm. Now, why would anybody write, why would Caroline Bergvall of Via write this thing about a shibboleth? I guess while you're thinking of an answer, mm -hmm. um, I would say that I respect tremendously 
that's a bad thing to say since I curated this, but um, I'm pleased that chapter 9.3 works with, well, Buck, Buck is Canadian, um, uh, Bergvall is uh, French Norwegian, uh, Rosemary Waldrop is playing on her own German accent, yeah. uh, and Tracy Morris is talking about the Middle Passage from Africa. There's, so, there's a lot of uh, international considerations here, and say parsley is worth mentioning in this regard because of the thing about embodied speech. Why, do, why, would, she, why would it fit her plan to do a piece like that, Gabe? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Bergvall is really interested in is, is a multilingualism in the sense of how things change between languages, how they might be expressed in different languages differently. Um, I think she's in, interested in, in, in transformation through language. Um, now, that, historically speaking, has not always been a positive thing. If we say, oh, it transforms in other languages, that's not always a good thing, uh, and it can actually be quite bad. Um, and she's really interested in archives and historical work, um, and most of her work has dealt with this. So one of the things that's going on in VIA that we don't really address is that these are translations from Italian, and part of the process of this is the Translation Act, that actually it's so imperfect that you can have this many, and there's way more than just on this page, um, interpretations of the same three lines of, of Italian terza rima, and that they could have enough of a difference from each other that they could create an effect together when collaged. So she's interested in that, and here it has, I think, more of a neutral, positive tone. But in, say, Parsley, she's interested in how that transformation through languages, how immigration and all this has come to a head where it's become a dangerous thing, has become a shibboleth, or has become a marker of, like, deserving death, if you can't say something as arbitrary as Parsley correctly. If you project the Trujillo massacre, mm -hmm mass killing, right, genocide, onto what Tracy Morris is trying to say about the Middle Passage, then Tracy, by not pronouncing things in a classical manner, by stuttering, is potentially doomed to the same fate. That is to say, by speaking out, by doing the Dickinsonian stutter, which is what Susan Howe thought uh, Dickinson risks being so marginal that she can be destroyed, yeah. fortunately not by the Trujillo of Massachusetts yeah. of Dickinson's time, but certainly those who didn't like her attitude toward the Civil War, or those who didn't like her unwillingness to publish, or et cetera, et cetera, right? So she becomes even more radical when you think about how's bringing out the shibboleth mm -hmm. in her, all those weird poems that are doing things poems are not supposed to do and try, you know, it's not just anti-feminism and anti-Semitism that gets Gertrude Stein, everybody uh, saying that, you know, she's a witch or weird or, you know, we don't want to listen to her. So the people who are willing to risk, it's all a shibboleth. Every th all the experimentation of the way, how doing things with words, uh, it's all a risk that you will, f you will suffer the fate of someone who cannot pronounce correctly. Mm -hmm. 